Everyone, please stand and we'll be singing, There Shall Be Showers of Blessings. abundantly and above measure. Amen? Uh, you may be seated. It's good to see you here tonight. Thanks for being with us. Uh, it's always good. I love to end the Lord's day in the Lord's house with the Lord's people. I've heard rumor that there's a pretty big football game going on, but it's better to be here than uh, watching that. Amen? Amen? And by the way, don't tell me what's going on because I'm recording it, okay? So, uh, uh, so let's, just, let's just talk about Jesus while we're here. Uh, let's just talk about Jesus. And listen to him tro starting trouble back here, James. He loves to cause trouble. And, uh, and uh, we'll just figure out what happened in the game on our own way, right? We'll do that that way. Well, on Sunday nights, uh, I like to, when, I'm when, when it's possible, and I try to make it possible uh, every Sunday night except for when we have a missionary, but I like to highlight missionary endeavors that we support uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, Operation Christmas Child is a little different. That's a, uh, that's a Samaritan's Purse ministry that we contribute to. We send shoe boxes, and, and, and that's a passion of uh, Sister Lori Eaton, and she takes uh, the, the lead with that. And we have these uh, Operation Christmas Child diners this year, remember, the first Wednesday of every month. All the proceeds from that go to that Operation Christmas Child project, and uh, that's going to be uh, the ministry that we highlight this Sunday night. So I'm going to ask Lori if she'll come to this uh, podium or this pulpit, and she's going to share uh, some, uh, just kind of like a report. Come on ahead, Lori, on Operation Christmas Child, and then I'll read something about that when she's finished. The mission of Operation Christmas Child is to demonstrate God's love in a tangible way to children in need around the world and together with the local church worldwide to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, we have done shoe boxes for the last several years, and this past year was just such a huge success. Um, I just want to thank everybody who helped to make it, you know, so so wonderful. It really is a team effort, and it couldn't be done without all of us. Um, a very special thank you to all the ladies who helped with the diners last year. I certainly can't do that alone. That it is, it all is a group effort. Um, our shoebox goal for 2021 was 100 boxes, and we made 103 boxes. 
We had 19 turned in and six built online for a total of 128, and that is the most that we've ever done. So it's just really exciting for me to see the growth of this ministry. Um, the total collected for our region, which is the Lake Cumberland area, was 15,112, and the national totals of boxes collected was 10,505,155. So it's getting back to where it kind of was before COVID. It's not quite there yet, but it's, it's getting close. Um, and the online boxes that people built, um, pay for online, they're being built right now, being packed right now in Charlotte, North Carolina um, until like the end of February. So if anybody is interested in being a part of that and going down to pack, they've got lots of spots still open to do that. Um, I can get you that information if you're interested. Um, last year, our boxes went to Honduras, Benin, Mali, and Madagascar. And this year, our boxes were sent to a hard to reach area and so we'll never know for sure exactly where they went, but um, there's a video. Joe, if you'll play that video, it'll explain what a hard to reach area is. So we'll watch that real quick. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness will have the light of life. Many of the countries that we're working in, they're very hostile to the gospel. They're very dangerous places where these children are growing up. A shoebox gift can really be light in a dark place. Generally, uh, Operation Christmas Child is seen as a, as a fun, lighthearted project, but there's a whole other side of what we're doing. We go into places where a person can lose their life if you tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Thousands of Christians are forced to flee again, facing imminent execution. There were a number of civilian casualties. We're working with local believers who uh, face incredible opposition on a, on a daily basis. <laughs> Many of our believers, our friends who follow Christ, are faced constantly uh, by interrogation, by secret police, investigation, uh, burning the churches down, uh, persecuting, even, even to the extent of death. I mean, everything is, um, is kind of discreet and hidden. It is dangerous, but God has given us ways. One of the ways is these shoeboxes. The believers are literally putting their lives on the line to share the gospel with the next generation, and we want to be able to help them do that through the power of a, of a simple shoebox gift. I have seen these boxes go into areas of the world where there's been war, and years later I have had people come to me and say, I was a kid and you gave a box and it changed my life. It gave me hope. Thank you, thank you. Very good. In the midst of the, the challenges that these local believers are facing, we are seeing the church grow. And so uh, we want to continue to fan that flame, continue to have the opportunity to share the love of Christ. Pray for these boxes as they go to countries around the world. We need your help. Don't back off. We need your help. We need it now. What if what mattered most to you had to be a secret? We're so blessed in this country not to have to keep Jesus a secret, but not everybody has that. And it's, it's a real honor that our boxes went to a place like that because you know, most boxes, mostly the only the online ones go because they have to just have certain things that won't be offensive anywhere at all. And, and our boxes evidently were good enough that, that they made, the, made that test. So we held nine diners last year, and along with other donations, we raised $3,898. At $9 per box for the 128 that, or the 100 and no, six of them. Anyway, for ones that we sent, we spent $1,098 on shipping 
And after purchasing over 200 Hot Wheels for this year's boxes, um, on sale of course, um, we had $50 left over. So we pretty much spent everything that we collected. Um, we had quite a lot of items left over that we sent as filler to the processing center. Um, it was not enough that we could make more boxes with, but it was enough that could help fill the boxes there that come in kind of light. So um, their motto is they don't like to send air, so they not only like shoe boxes to be packed and sent, but they also need filler items as well for some of the other boxes. Um, this year, instead of randomly buying things on clearance like we usually do to try to just build random boxes, we're going to focus on specific items for each box so we can streamline our process to make it organizationally easier and more cost productive um, for each box. Um, every year is a learning process and we want to always strive to be better and, and to be good stewards of, of the resources that God has given us. Um, if you would like to see a list of items that we try to send, I'm happy to share that with you. Um, we typically can fit 40 to 50 items in a box. It is really amazing how much we can get in a box and what a blessing it is to a child. Our church goal for this year, for 2022, will remain at 100 boxes, but with a bigger challenge. Um, I hope you were able to visit our OCC table while it was up in the lobby. On it, there was a sample pair of shoes from Because International called The Shoe That Grows, and we would love to put those in our boxes this year, but it will increase the cost of our boxes significantly. Um, we can generally pack a box for under $20, usually closer to 15 but the shoes themselves are $20 a pair. Um, we're adding an extra diner this year, so we'll have 10 instead of nine. And we're also considering doing an adoption program for the, for the shoes, you know, maybe those who can't attend the diners or for whatever reason, or, you know, just wanna maybe donate to the shoes or, you know, they maybe they could sponsor a pair of shoes instead of doing diners. Um, but if you have any ideas on how we could raise, you know, extra money or, you know, to do the shoes, that, that is most welcome. I would love to hear your ideas. Um, and if you need more, more information about the shoes, you can visit the website of Because International, and, and it tells all about them on there. Um, speaking of diners, they will be held the first Wednesday of the month, beginning this week, February 2nd, and they'll go through November. Um, this week's diner is homemade chicken noodle soup with Hawaiian roll ham sandwiches, dessert, drinks. Um, for those that don't know, the diner is open from 5.30 to 6.30 on Wednesday before church. Um, and we just take donations for whatever you want to pay for your meal. Um, anyone interested in helping with diners or other OCC-related jobs through the year can let myself or Dana know. She's my partner in crime now. I'm really happy to have her helping um, with everything. Um, as always, though, prayer is the most important thing that goes in every box. We can't all donate. We can't all work. We can't all do, you know, unpack stuff that we buy or whatever, but we can all pray. That's the one thing that every believer can do. And one last detail about all this is um, most of you probably shop on Amazon. And, and I don't know if you know about this or not, but they have a program called Amazon Smile. And you can choose a charity to donate to, and they will donate money for every, for every dollar you spend, they donate, I think it's like 0.05%. It doesn't cost you anything, it's just something that they do, you choose your charity, they donate the money. Um, so if you aren't already taking advantage of this program, I, you know, please consider Samaritan's Purse if you are an Amazon shopper on the Amazon Smile. Um, last quarter, Samaritan's Purse received over $51,000 just from people shopping on Amazon, so. Um, and I pulled a couple FAQs off of the OCC website to help you understand the ministry a little better for those, you know, we've got a lot of new people and some people might not be as familiar with it. And the first question is, how does a shoebox gift impact a child in need? Operation Christmas Child is not intended as a solution for meeting physical needs, but rather a strategy for the local church to meet spiritual needs of children in their communities. The unexpected gift delights and sparks hope in the life of a child as they hear of Jesus' love for them. Shoebox gifts are given freely in Jesus' name. You know, Operation Christmas Child, their goal is to give one child, every child one box in a lifetime. And that might be the only gift that that kid ever gets. But, you know, a, a well-packed box given in the name of Jesus can really spark hope and, and change lives. Um, the, the second question was, how does shoebox gift 
how do shoebox gifts impact the local church? In more than 100 receiving countries, shoebox gifts are used by local Christians as a strategy for evangelism, discipleship, and the multiplication of believers and churches in their communities. More important than the items inside the shoebox, the gifts are an opportunity to share God's love and the good news of Jesus Christ with the children in need. Local Christians who know the culture and language best are given effective resources in their own language and a solid biblical foundation so that they can communicate the gospel within their own communities through shoebox outreach events and the Greatest Journey Discipleship Program. For example, in Fiji, a pastor hosted an Operation Christmas Child shoebox outreach event in a rural community that had no church. He then invited the children to attend the Greatest Journey Follow-Up Discipleship Program. As the students gathered for the discipleship lessons, their parents grew curious and began attending too. The village elder became a believer and offered his property as a place for the new church to meet. Today, 80 people attend regularly and five additional churches have been started in surrounding villages. This is one example of over 1,000 churches planted annually as a result of Operation Christ Christmas Child in regions where we work. The evangelism and discipleship resources utilized by Operation Christmas Child were intentionally developed with input from local believers in 16 countries from six continents and are specifically focused on children. In the 11 countries where shoebox gifts are packed, Operation Christmas Child provides an opportunity for participants to be a part of fulfilling the Great Commission. Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28:19. It's just so neat that that was our sermon this morning, and we get to talk about this tonight. In this church-to-church -church ministry, model churches who pack shoebox, shoebox gifts partner with local churches around the world as they share God's love with children in need and provide follow-up discipleship through the greatest journey. And again, I just want to thank everybody so much for your support um, of this ministry. We are helping to reach the children of the world with the gospel of Christ one shoebox at a time. And as we read this morning, Mark 16, 15, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We can't all go, but we can all do our part to help those that do. And now Brother Travis is going to read a poem because I know if I try to, I'll cry. So. It's called Look Beyond Your Shoebox. After I read this, I'm going to lead us in prayer. I packed this. I pack the Christmas shoebox gift. I do it every year. These gifts are sent around the world to bring a child some cheer. I focused on my shoebox and what I put inside when God told me to look beyond and see the other side. I looked beyond my shoebox, and there I saw a friend who helped to get my shoebox from here to journey's end. In truth, there were so many who worked along the way. They took these gifts around the world. They labored night and day. Some checked and taped and cartonized and moved my box with care, while some raised hands of blessing and filled my box with prayer. I looked beyond my shoebox, and there I saw a child who received this gift of love while sitting meek and mild. She heard the gospel message. He listened quietly while many prayed Jesus to save their souls eternally. Then it was time to open from me their gifts of joy, such noise I can't imagine, to see each treat and toy. I looked beyond my shoebox, and there I saw the Lord. He smiled and said, Well done, my child. Come see now your reward. And as I turned, I saw a line, far as the eye could see, of children coming to say thanks for boxes sent by me. Thank you for your gift of love and for the gospel too. Because you filled a shoebox, I'm now in heaven with you. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege that we have to participate in the work of your ministry. And there are so many ways in which we can be involved. Father, forgive us, and may we never make excuses for why we are not busy about the business of seeing the gospel communicated to lost souls. And Father, this is just one example of involvement that we can have to send the gospel globally uh, and uh, do our work to uh, prepare uh, shoe boxes of, of gifts of love to needy kids who can receive a gift from people they don't know, but most importantly, as has been expressed from Lori and also in the video, uh, the gospel presented in that child's language in that shoe box. 
The greatest gift, Father, is the gift of knowing Christ as Lord and Savior. And that's what these boxes are all about. And what a blessing to think that the boxes that our church had a hand in preparing and sending last year went to these uh, um, underreached, hard to reach areas in our world where the name of Christ is not allowed to be proclaimed, where Christians and churches are uh, actively and publicly persecuted and prosecuted. And Father, we thank you that we had a hand in lighting that part of this dark world. I pray that we'll continue to do that. And I pray that we'll continue to think of the missionaries that we know personally and that we have a hand in supporting. Father, help us to uh, stay connected. Uh, uh, I, I want to, as a church, lead us to continue to be connected to these men and women and these ministries, Father, um, that we shouldn't just send money to, but that we should participate in and pray for them and know them and hold them up before the Lord as they are going to the uttermost parts of the world. We're not all called to go abroad, but we are all called to do the gospel work here and to help and partner with those who you have sent into the uttermost parts of the world. I thank you for this ministry. I thank you for Lori and Danny, Dana as they put their, um, uh, they're their primary leaders behind it. And Father, I pray that we will participate uh, in this and all the ministries of our church with all of our might for all of your glory. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Everyone, please stand once again. We'll be singing How Firm a Foundation. be seated. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer right now. I'm going to ask uh, if we'll uh, keep in our prayers the, um, uh, the Jimmy Fain family. I mentioned that uh, Brother Jimmy Fain, uh, long connection to this church through the family and his own personal connection, uh, was called home to glory last Thursday. His funeral arrangements are in northern Kentucky uh, at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Cold Spring where his son Jeff is the pastor, uh, but that's going to be Wednesday um, tell me the times again, Barbara. And funeral at five. Okay, visitation from two to five, and the funeral starts at five. And that's at Cold. That's at the Emanuel Baptist Church in Cold Springs, Kentucky, uh, that up in the northern Kentucky area. And then Carla Sparks, his mom, Jean Sanderson, passed away. That she's a good friend. Uh, uh, Carly is of this church, and so just keep that family in your prayers. And then, uh, right before church. Amanda asked uh, if we'd remember her uncle, Robert Atkins, uh, in prayer. She's not in here for me to confirm that, but I'm pretty sure it's Atkins is his last name. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer before we open up our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 tonight. And uh, we'll take these requests uh, before the Lord. Father in heaven, I thank you for your goodness to us. I, I thank you for that firm foundation that we sang about. You know, what a... Uh, what a joy to know that in a world that is just always shifting, with, with what our culture uh, calls truth, uh, change, uh, the older I get, the, the faster it seems to change. Uh, and um, it's because they don't have a truth. The truth is what uh, is important and relevant uh, to them uh, at the moment. And Father, we have uh, an unshakable firm foundation. That doesn't mean that we won't be shaken, but... As we just sang, no matter how all of hell seems to shake us, uh, you will never, no, never forsake us. And we thank you for that promise from the Old Testament repeated in the New Testament. And so, Father, we lift up these requests. We pray for the Fain family. Uh, we ask your blessing on them um, uh, as they uh, lay to rest their loved one. And Father, we pray for the same thing for the Sparks family as Miss Carla um, uh, memorializes and, and honors the passing of her, of her mom who has been called to glory as well. We thank you for the salvation of both these individuals. And that doesn't lessen our hurt and our separation, but it does give us cause to rejoice because as believers, we grieve, as Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4, not as those of the world who have no hope, but we have a hopeful morning. We pray for these requests that were mentioned. Amanda's uncle, uh, Robert. Uh, I pray for my uncle, Jeff, uh, who had a very bad diagnosis and was not expecting to hear what he heard about his cancer, about cancer. 
Uh, but Father, we uh, lift him up to you and we thank you that his trust and confidence is in this Christ. And that is, in, is the one in whose name we pray this evening. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 1, that's where we are tonight because uh, I've spent the month of January, the first Sunday of the month, uh, a, a pattern I've tried to establish in my four and a half years here, the first Sunday of the month, uh, what I call a Bible Sunday. Again, not that other Sundays aren't focused on the Bible, they are. Uh, we don't want Bible Baptist uh, Bible to just be in our name, we want it to be in our hearts and our minds and our lives and on our tongues. Uh, but I, I do like to take at least one Sunday where that we're focusing on the need because it's easy to forget what we know. It's easy to take for granted what we have. We do that all the time. And, and it's, easy, it's easy for us to belong to a Bible Baptist, to Bible believing Baptist church, a church that's even got Bible in its name, and yet be much more attentive to other things than the scriptures. So we don't want to do that, and it's good for us to focus on that in a very specific way. And I like to do that the first Sunday of the year. And then I thought this year, I haven't done this before, but I thought it'd be good for us to revisit the idea of what the Scripture says about the truth, the, the church, the truth of the church. The church is central to the purpose and plan of God uh, uh, for our ministry, for our lives, for fulfilling what the Scripture has to teach us and, and say to us. And so we've been doing that, and we're going to finish that in a very uh, focused way uh, this evening. And that's why I've got you in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. This book, this letter, particularly this chapter, provides instruction as to what God intends and what God in desires every church to be. Every one of us could probably have uh, an idea or a desire and expectations for, for our church or for churches in general. But it's best to know, don't you think, what God desires and expects our church. I, I entitled this, uh, What Bible Baptist Church Should Be. And it's easy, if you're bent this way, you can read that title and say, well, man, the preacher's saying that we're not all, the preacher's saying that we're lacking, or he's, he's, he's kind of being negative. Well, we're, we're not all that we can be, right? I mean, if, if you ever get to the point where you think you're all that, you need to have a wake-up call, right? Whether you're talking about yourself individually, whether you're talking about your marriage, whether you're talking about yourself professionally, or whether we're talking about a local church. You can always, that's what I learned in the Army, it's a great lesson to repeat all through life and for every scenario, you can always improve your foxhole. And you should. You should always be working on it. You should always be improving it. You should, Paul said, to, to make it spiritual, Philippians chapter 3, not as though I have apprehended, but uh, uh, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before I press on toward the mark for the prize of the high coin of God in Christ Jesus. So when I say what Bible Baptist Church should be, I'm not saying that we're not this. I'm not saying that we've left off this. I'm, not say I'm saying that we should continue to be striving what 1 Thessalonians 1 records, which is what God intends and desires every church to be. It describes five or six characteristics uh, that every church should have. And I want you to note, as we, read through this, uh, as we read through this chapter, there's no reference to congregational size or, or buildings or programs or average offering amount or any of those tangible metrics that we often use to gauge a church's effectiveness. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those measurements in and of themselves, but I am saying unequivocally that attendance, offerings, buildings, programs, those metrics are not the primary means by which we measure the health and effectiveness of a local church. They're just not. Not because I pastor a relatively small church in a rural county, but because God's word doesn't describe that, right? That's our basis. That's what we go by. So let's read it. First Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm going to read the whole chapter. It's only 10 verses. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for y'all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God our Father. 
knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, your salvation. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power in the whole, and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia, which means all of Greece in that time. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. Macedonia was the part of Greece, kind of like northern Greece, where Thessalonica was. Achaia was southern Greece, below the Peloponnesus, which is where Corinth and places like that were. Verse 9, for they themselves... Show, show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. How you turned to God, pay attention to that, from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Let's pray again. Father in heaven, we ask you to bless the reading of your word, the proclamation of your word, and Father, the application of it to our hearts, to our minds, and to this church. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. What does God desire? Six things, six characteristics that should mark that we should strive to be as the Bible Baptist Church. And here's the first one. We see it uh, in the first five verses, really, and that is Bible Baptist Church should be a saved church. A people of a church that's comprised of saved people. Now, that is not something that should be taken for granted, right? In Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, you can look that up as your homework. According to Jesus' teaching in that section of Matthew 13, Satan sows tares among the wheat. Satan has sought to infiltrate, it's always his plan to infiltrate Christianity. And, and as a Baptist church, Baptist churches insist on a saved membership. So the only way that you're going to get in that baptistry, the only way we're going to receive you as either a candidate for baptism or receive you based on a statement of faith or in a letter of transfer from another church is if you have a profession of faith. But, that, but we don't know men's hearts, right? We, got no men. we can't know another man's heart. We're not Jesus. Jesus need not that anybody testify to him of what was in man because Jesus knows all men's heart, the, uh, the end of chapter 2, and John tells us. But that's not true of me or of anyone else. And there are frequently unsaved church members, even in Baptist churches. A person may walk the aisle, shake hands with the pastor, make a profession of faith in Christ, be baptized, become a church member, but never truly be born again. That's why uh, I don't like any kind of evangelistic techniques or, or, or um, altar calls that play on manipulation or emotions or whatever else. I think that if I wanted to, uh, I could work myself and, and whip you all up into a state so that maybe I could get some type of response any time I wanted it, if I really went worked at that. But the, the exact opposite is the way that I go about ministry because I don't want somebody just responding to Travis. I want you being led by the Holy Spirit, if that makes sense. Because I want reality. I want the real deal. I don't want somebody just responding because they've had... There are too many people in our churches who have had emotional experiences but no real relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's not helpful. It's not helpful for the individual. It's not helpful for the local church or the cause of Jesus. And Paul identifies the Thessalonians' position, you see it there in verse 1, as be, look at it in the middle of the verse, uh, which is in God. He, he identifies their position as being in God, and also in verse 1 and also in verse 3, as being in Christ, and then in verse 5, in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and so Paul's wish for them is to fully experience, verse 1, grace and peace. And it's only possible for someone to be in God, Christ, the Holy Spirit. We're not talking about three different deities, but three different aspects of uh, the triune God. Uh, it's only possible for someone to be in God and to experience grace and peace if that person is saved. 
And so verse 2 says, Paul is thankful for them. Another hint that the, uh, at least at this point in the history of that church, the entire membership of this church was redeemed. In a practical sense, Paul refers to the Thessalonians as brethren. You see that there. And as beloved, which are also titles for saved people. Paul remembered, this is, this is the verse I made mention of, I, I love verse 3. Paul remembered their work of faith and their labor of love and their patience of hope. You know, we, should, we should have a faith that works, we should have a love, that labor, a love that labors, and we should have a hope that endures. That's what patience of hope means, it's an enduring hope. And if you're reading a more modern translation, that's exactly how you'll see it phrased. That, that's what should I, those things should identify us, a Faith that works, What's, what good is a faith that doesn't? A love that labors and a hope that endures all the way into the end. All of those things, by the way, are clear evidence of salvation. According to 1 Corinthians 13, 13, faith, hope, and love are the foremost Christian graces. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love, right? The Thessalonians had a faith that worked, a love that labored, and a hope that endured. They had heard the word, demonstrated the working of the Holy Spirit in their hearts, and Paul was confident that this was a safe church. Beloved, if Bible Baptist Church is to be what we should be, we have to preach and practice from this pulpit in our classrooms, up in the Family Life Center when it comes to our kids and our teens, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not just about drawing a crowd. It's about preaching the gospel and discipling those who come discipling those to whom we go. Um, I've, I've, I've got a degree in business administration. I, I, I understand, on, not that that means much, but I understand on some level marketing. And, 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 and look, I think there's an aspect to church, quote-unquote, marketing that's just common sense. It's good for us to put our name out there. It's good to have clear signage. It's good for us to make sure that our facilities look right. I'm not saying that we should try to hide or, 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 or not care about how we look or how we present ourselves. But there's a level, there is a fine line that we don't want to cross. We are not just trying to get backsides in pews. We are not just trying to do and sound and look however we need to to get as many people up. And then what? We want to be reaching out with the truth of the God. And that truth must be spoken in love. Yeah, I, I sound like a broken record, but it's okay. It, it, to what you've already heard, it's good for you to be reminded of that, and it's not hard for me to repeat what, what many of you already know. It's not true if it's not spoken in love, and it's not love if it's not true. Does that make sense? It's just it, truth and love go together. And we have to be serious about communicating in love the truth of the gospel. And that is an awareness that not everybody's going to be interested in that. They just won't be. But that's okay. Leave that up to, leave, leave, leave the numbers and the, uh, the number of people who come and the number of people who make professions, leave that up to God. Let's just be faithful. And we're going to see seasons where there's phenomenal growth and we're going to see seasons where the water's trickling. Let me put it this way. There'll be seasons where the water is gushing and there'll be seasons where the water is trickling. But we leave that up to God. He will handle what only he can handle, but we have to be faithful for what, to what we're given. And we need to, if Bible Baptist Church is to be the church that we should be, then we have to be a church that is saved, a church that honestly preaches the gospel and is focused on uh, folks coming to know Christ and being discipled rather than folks just coming and filling out uh, attendance cards. Number two, Bible Baptist Church should be a submissive church. That's what uh, uh, the first half of verse six and really all of verse six is, is getting at. The church at Thessalonica followed the Lord as they followed the leaders. The Greek word translated followers. So you read there in verse 6, and ye became followers of us. That Greek word translated followers is mimetes. Um, you may hear the English word that we get from mimetes. It's mimic, mimic. A follower is an imitator of his leader. A follower submits and surrenders his own will to that of, uh, of his leader. So look with me. Hold your place in 1 Thessalonians, but go back to 1 Corinthians 
And first of all, to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16, and uh, we'll read that passage first and then move on to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, wherefore Paul was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wherefore I uh, beseech, that's a good King James word for I beg or I plead or I urge you, wherefore uh, I'm pleading with you, be ye followers of who? Me, uh-oh. Well, you, now hold on, Paul. We're, supposed to, we're not supposed to make disciples of ourselves, Paul. We're supposed to make disciples of Christ. All those usual tropes that people fall. Hey, look, uh, listen to what he's saying. I'm begging you, be ye followers of me. But don't just read that in isolation. Don't, don't read that and think of this pastor you knew of back when who was this egomaniac who was just trying to uh, get a following to himself and he didn't care about the gospel or didn't care about Jesus. Don't just hear that in isolation. Be ye followers of me. Now, uh, let's look at... Verse chapter 11 and verse 1. This goes together. First, first clause of that sentence, be ye followers of me, sounds like what we just read, but this is where, uh, this is where it, it rounds it out for us. Even as I also am of who? Christ. We, we follow leaders who are following Christ. And as, we, and as we're following Christ, and, and ourselves and growing in the, in the knowledge and, and, and grace and the truth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we, if there's leaders who deviate from that, we can work to help correct them. And if they won't be corrected, then guess what? We no longer follow them, right? That's how that works. That's how it's supposed to go. Submission, however, is a critical aspect of church life because, and this is true of any organization, it is necessary for some to lead, but most to follow. That's not very popular to say. And I know it can sound odd coming from me, but uh, we ha you have to preach the whole counsel of God, right? I can't skip over things. We, we're better together. And I'm an army guy, but it, it, the, one of the best illustrations for this is a boat. I miss Bob and Grace not being able to hear. He always loved my Navy analogies. But we're, we're, the Bible Baptist Church is in a boat together. Not the USS Minnow. Ronnie understands that joke. The rest of you, Luke doesn't even know what that is. We watched, we watched half an episode of Gilligan's Island on uh, cable yesterday, and he's like, he was bored in five minutes with that. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, you know, so we're, you know, we're not, you know, we're not being shipwrecked somewhere. Uh, the, the, US, uh, the, the Bible Baptist Church is in, is in a boat, and we're all, we're all pulling together. But the way God has designed the leadership of a church, just like within the home, Christ is our head, the Scriptures are our compass, but as the pastor, I'm the one with the hand on the wheel, right? That's the way that works. That's why I, I, I need your prayers. But if we've got a, a, a bunch of people who are trying to grab the wheel, guess what's going to happen to the boat? It's going to run aground. It's, it, it just, we can't do that. It's, it's my turn. It's my turn to have the wheel. It's my, no, that's not how it works. We need to be submissive to the, and that's why we need to be sure it's not that the pastor is the final authority in the local church. We understand as a Baptist congregation, it's congregational polity. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that we vote every Sunday on whether the preacher is going to preach next Sunday or tonight or, or you know, what his text is going to be. You know, uh, there's extremes on both sides. A preacher is not supposed to be a dictator, and a church is not to stand over top of the preacher uh, looking over his shoulder all the time and, and, and countermanding him. We're supposed to follow the leadership of Christ, and we're to follow the leadership of our pastor or uh, in some churches, pastors, as they follow Christ. And, and, and we, we love each other, and we hold each other accountable, and, and we walk together. And the pursuit of each individual Christian should be to imitate Christ, to, uh, to follow after Jesus, and that is the key to church unity and harmony. As I'm talking about uh, Bible Baptist Church, if we're to be what we're supposed to be, we have to be a submissive church. If all the church's members are striving to be like Christ, there would be no problem and getting along with each other. There will be sparks at times. None of us are perfect. But if, if our endeavor is to be like Christ, 
we're going to be going in the same direction. But when church members are not in tune with one another, it's usually because they are not following Christ. They're following someone or something else who isn't following Christ. Unity in the church is not a result of running around and adjusting to everyone else. Unity is a result of everyone being like Christ Jesus the Lord. And Bible Baptist Church should be submissive to Christ and to the Christ-like leaders that he has set in leadership. Uh, let me take a detour. Look, look at Acts 20 with me. I'm going to kind of depart from my notes for a second. That doesn't mean I'm going to chase a rabbit trail for long. But um, I, uh, ever since I've been ordained, 2003, Acts chapter 20, this passage has, has weighed heavy on me in, in, a, in a good sense, uh, I mean. Uh, but it, it's a responsibility that rocks me to my knees in, in prayer. Look at verse 28. He's talking to the, uh, the elders from Ephesus. Verse 17 tells you that. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders. Elders is a New Testament word for pastors. Okay? Look at verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto who? First of all, yourselves, and to all the what? Flock. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's figurative language for a local church. Over the which the Holy Spirit has made you what? Overseers, which is another word that Scripture uses in the New Testament for pastor. To feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Acts 20, 28 is a guiding principle for my life. I, I recognize that I, I've got to watch my own life and doctrine, as Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy, or, or 1 Timothy chapter 4. And then I recognize that I'm not here because I ran a slick campaign. I'm not here because I really marketed myself well, and you know, why wouldn't you choose me to be your pastor? I'm not here because I had certain people here walking around with flags and driving around, the, uh, driving around the neighborhood pulling a sign in the back of their truck, vote Gilbert for a pastor, right? Was there a vote and all that stuff? Yeah. But I'm here, there, there's, there's, man, there's man's responsibility and there's God's sovereignty. I'm here as pastor, because God set me down here. Right? That's how that works. That, that, that's not just true of me. That's true of every pastor of a church. That's something that we all need to get a hold of. I'm not saying that we haven't, but it's something we need to recognize. And I'm telling you, Acts 20, 28 is, is, is a powerful verse in my life. I hope it is in yours, because we should be submissive. We, as we are submissive to Christ and, and the leaders that he's placed over us, we will be the kind of church that we should be. He's called us to be. Number three, Bible Baptist Church should be a suffering church. And then you say, well, yeah, with you as our pastor, how can we not be? <laughs> right? I see what you're doing here. I see how you wove that together, Pastor. That's ingenious. But it says, it says here in, in verse 6, uh, they re having received the word, in much affliction... Of course, it's interesting. What's the next clause? With joy of the Holy Spirit. So there was much affliction at the time when the Thessalonians received the word. Beloved, true churches can expect suffering. That's exactly what Paul wrote to his young charge, uh, Timothy, in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3 uh, and, and verse 12. Yea, in all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. However, we must be careful that our suffering is not because of sin, not because of some kind of odd behavior, not because of uh, something that's contrary to the Scriptures, but our suffering is because of the gospel. So Bible Baptist Church, like the church at Thessalonica, will experience suffering. I don't say that to uh, scare you. I don't say that to intimidate you. It's good for us to have an awareness. We have to be aware that when we suffer as individuals or as a church, and as part of a church, as Miss Debbie reminded us with her thank you note this morning, when some weep, we all weep. When some rejoice, we all rejoice. And it affects all of us. And we have to recognize that just because they're suffering doesn't mean that there's sin. We suffer, we will suffer as a result of faithfulness. But we should count it all joy to suffer shame for his name. 
a saved and submissive church is going to antagonize the world. Not because we're seeking to poke the bear, but just because we're different. Hey, look, nobody likes that which is different, right? Nobody likes that which is different, right? Yeah, if one of these things ain't like the other one, you know, somebody's going to be doing this. And, and, and it's easy to stand out. Again, another army analogy. When we're, you know, the, 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 in, the first sergeant standing before the battalion, and he tells battalion, uh, left face, and we all face the left, and he says, forward march, and we all step off, and you know you step off with your left foot first, but then before too long, you got Private Benjamin from uh, somewhere, and he can't walk and chew gum at the same time, and when, and when everybody else's left foot is hitting the ground, his right foot's hitting the ground, it, you stand out. And beloved, to this world, we are the ones who are out of step. But if Private Benjamin doesn't think he's in step, he thinks you're out of step. So to the world, we look like we're out of step. But if we're following after God's word, we are the ones who are marching to the beat of the Savior's cadence. And we got to continue to do that no matter how it makes us stand out and no matter how it makes us to suffer. The small church in Smyrna. Hold your place in 1 Thessalonians and look to Revelation uh, chapter 2. Um, I would love to preach through this section of these three churches in Revelation 1 through 3, but I'm not too crazy about preaching through Revelation 4 through 22 yet. Um, so I, I, I'm going to harness myself and, and we'll get there eventually. But in Revelation 2 verses 8 through 11, the small church in Smyrna, they understood that Churches that seek to be faithful will be persecuted. Life was not easy for that church there. They were weary from incessant persecution. So if you look, uh, Revelation 2, look at verse 9. Let, let me just read the letter. And unto, verse 8, and unto the angel, the, pa, the messenger, the pastor, unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they're Jews, but are not. They're really the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt, what? Suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried. You shall have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto what? That means all the way to the end, and I will give you a crown of life. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death, which is the one that you need to be more concerned about. So in verse 9 there, I know your works and tribulation. That Greek word translated tribulation is thalipsis. And it, uh, it literally means to be crushed. Now I tell you that because the, the word Smyrna, the name of the town, is connected to the word myrrh. Now y'all know what myrrh is, right? Myrrh is one of the, one of the three gifts that the wise men gave to Jesus at his birth, they, uh, or really, it's about two years after he was born, uh, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Myrrh was an ancient aromatic residue extracted from the balls of tree, and it's frequently connected with Christ's life. It was present at his birth, as I just mentioned. It was present at his crucifixion. Mark chapter 15, verse 23 talks about that. It was present at his burial. It was, myrrh was part of the things that had been mixed into his burial clothes. Myrrh yields its fragrant aroma when it's, guess what? Crushed. When it's crushed. And the more it's crushed, the sweeter it smells. And like myrrh, the church at Smyrna was being crushed with persecution. And the more it was crushed, the sweeter its fragrance to God and to those who had... Uh, um, um, being led by the Spirit to, uh, to trust in the gospel. The church of Smyrna lived inside a pressure cooker, and they were given two options. This is the same option the Bible Baptist Church is given. I'm not saying that we live in the same kind of pressure cooker, but it's true. I, I'm talking about Bible Baptist Church because it's the church I pastor. It's the church that I'm preaching to tonight. And, you know, other people may hear this later on, and that's great, but it's true of every church, but I'm talking to my church. Bible Baptist Church lives in a pressure cooker, and we've got two choices. We will stand firm for our Savior, or we will surrender to Satan. There's only two options. You don't have a third. There's no third way. 
There is no neutrality. Stand firm for Christ or surrender to the world. The believers at, Sa at Smyrna chose the former. They stood firm. And it cost them. It always does. Because standing firm for Christ will always bring worldly persecution on the believer. Look, beloved, you cannot be a popular Christian. You cannot be a popular church. Does that make sense? And when you find people who are, it's got to make you say, hmm. Jesus never spoke a foul word. Jesus never did anything wrong. Jesus healed the lame. He made the mute to speak. He made the deaf to hear. He made the blind to see. He made the halt to walk. He took children and set them on his lap and blessed them. He brought the dead back to life, and they nailed him to wood after they ripped the flesh off his back. And if we just loosen up, if you just lose the jacket, man, if you just, they'll love you. Who are you talking about? Now, it doesn't mean you act foolish. It doesn't mean you act mean. It doesn't mean you act holier than thou. It means you stay true to God's word. The church that confronts the world is going to suffer from the world. The church that tries to imitate the world is going to suffer loss of its candlestick. Smyrna was willing to suffer for the one who had suffered for them. How about Bible Baptist Church? And we got to bring this to a close, but let's... Let's approach the runway here with number four, and we see it in verses five and six back in 1 Thessalonians chapter one. Bible Baptist Church should be a steadfast church. The Thessalonian church stood firmly on the word of God. That's what Paul says to them. Our, our gospel came not unto you in word only, but in power and the Holy Spirit. You became followers of, of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction. He also told them in chapter two, verse 13, you can look at that real quick. We think uh, for this cause, also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually works also in you that believe. They stand firm. Standing fast in the Lord requires two things. It requires not wavering doctrinally, and it requires maintaining a steadfast love. There it is again, truth and love. A church can be doctrinally sound, but spiritually dry. And the church at Ephesus was an example of that. Bible Baptist Church must be doctrinally pure and also totally passionate about the Lord. And sometimes I hear Christians lament a lack of excitement in their life or their church. But beloved, let me tell you this. If you think that church is a little too lame, a little too lax, not just enough excitement, look, look uh, be careful that you're not just connecting that to external stimuli. Some, some songs are going to affect us all differently. When, when our choir sings, These Are the Days of Elijah, and Roger's choir used to do that too, that, that's one of those songs that almost get me Pentecostal. I almost come out to pew when, uh, when that song's being sung because I love the truth of it and, and all the other aspects of it. Some songs make me just want to beat my chest and like the, like the publican, uh, bow my head and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Uh, Art, which is what music is, should affect us in that way. But listen to, uh, I, I, don't be, well, our church needs to do this, or we need to do this, you know, we, we can be, uh, stir it up, make it more exciting. Nothing is more exciting than following after Christ. Nothing. If it takes a certain kind of rhythm, or if it takes a certain kind of personality in a pulpit, to make you excited, you're excited for the wrong thing. And your excitement will last as long as the rhythm lasts or as, long, or as long as the personality lasts. But if you're excited at the truth of God's word and growing close to Christ and following after his word, then that well will never run dry. It can't. In Bible Baptist Church should be a steadfast church. And Bible Baptist Church should be a soul-winning church. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. Mark 16 says, to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And so this, 
uh, we're not all called to be missionaries with a capital M, but we're all called to be witnesses with a capital W. And that involves two things, what the world sees and what the world hears. They need to see our good works. They need to see us. They need to see our changed life. So I'll just highlight again, verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering we had among you. And how you, here's what the world saw about this Thessalonian church. They turned to the living and true God from their idols. They used to live and act a certain way in accordance with the gods they served. But now, having believed the gospel, they behaved differently. Right? Belief and behavior go together. You can't receive grace because of the way you behave. You can only receive grace by believing in the, in the free gift that Jesus provides. But having believed in the free uh, gift of grace that Jesus provides, that will cause you to behave differently. If it doesn't, you haven't received it. Belief and behavior are linked. Again, behavior can't cause the belief, but belief will change the behavior. So the world needs to see that, and then the world needs to hear the gospel. We, um, we hear the gospel preached. Faith cometh by what? Hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so, uh, again, in verse 8, uh, for from you, I, I, love, I love this word, it, uh, sound it out. You say, well, Travis, that's two words, man. Well, it's two words in the English, but there's only one word in the Greek. And the word in the Greek is um, ex, 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 exheo, exheo. And it's, again, our English word echo is derived from that, exheo. And so we are to echo, not ourselves or not someone else, we are to echo the gospel of Jesus Christ. From you echoed the word of the Lord. And that should be true of Bible Baptist Church. We should be a soul winning church, beloved. We should follow the soul winning pattern that Christ developed to that first congregation. And, and we should only proclaim the inerrant truth of God's word. And then finally, verse 10, Bible Baptist Church should be a second coming church. In other words, we should live with the awareness that Christ is coming again quickly. We don't know when. And we don't need to know, but we need to live in the awareness. I'm big on that word, awareness. We need to live in the awareness that Christ will be back soon. So how soon? I don't, I don't know. But yeah, and, and, and don't link, don't link COVID and stuff like that uh, to the end times. I mean, that, just, that should make you weary all over when you hear stuff like that. Paul thought that he was going to see Christ return. The, the point is we do not know, that, but we should expect it at any moment. That's why I use the word imminent imminent. And we need to live that way. You know, when I knew that, uh, when I knew that mom and dad, if I was left at the home by myself, and I knew that mom and dad would be back any moment, I acted differently than if I thought they were going to be gone for a while. Does that make sense? We need to live recognizing that Christ will return soon, and that he will return soon now is the time that we have to do the work that he's given us to do. Beloved, our church cannot be measured solely on the basis of average attendance, average offering, the number of missionaries we support, the number and the credentials of our paid staff, the size and the beauty of our buildings, or the innovative and contemporary or um, backward and traditional programming that we offer. Because some people like one or the other. Instead, we should be a church comprised of saved, submissive, suffering, steadfast, soul-winning, second-coming people. Then we will be fruitful and blessed, regardless of the circumstances. I want us to end a little differently. We're not going to sing an invitation uh, tonight, but I do want us to have a word of prayer. And then I'm going to go over some things with you before we're dismissed. So, let's go ahead and, and bow our heads for a word of prayer to conclude our preaching and to just kind of focus our hearts uh, on what we've heard, both in the, the recap of our ministry and, and partnering with Samaritan's Purse when it comes to OCC and also what God's Word calls us to. And then just right where you are, 
in the quietness uh, of your heart. And that's why I like every now and again, I don't always plan it, I just kind of play it by ear, but it's good to have moments where it's just stone cold quiet. It can make us unnerved, and I'm okay with that. Make any kind of commitment you need, but I hope your commitment will be along the characteristics that Bible Baptist Church should have as we discuss them for 1 Thessalonians. Father, we've heard from your word.